Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Elizabeth Dark, the Associate Director of Programs for the Kenyon Review, and we are glad that you have joined us this afternoon to celebrate David Lynn's new book launch, um, Children of God. Uh, before I begin, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, while you are taking a moment to check your phones, making sure they are silent or in airplane mode, let me point out to you that we have cake in the back for afterwards. Um, make sure you get a look at it before we cut it. Uh, it's pretty cool. And then we also have books from the Kenyon Bookstore for sale, and uh, David is happy to sign those if you would like to purchase one afterwards. Uh, net, oh, tomorrow, I'm sorry, tomorrow we have a reading by Stuart Onan, uh, 4.30 in the Cheever Room. This is in uh, collaboration with Gramercy Books, uh, the bookstore closer to Columbus than we are. Uh, and then next week we have a couple of events that are pretty fantastic. In celebration of Poetry Month, uh, we're having sort of poem in your pocket days. Uh, Chen Chen will be in Cheever Room at 410 on Wednesday uh, for a reading. And then Tommy Pico will be in Cheever Room 5 o'clock on Thursday. Um, the Chen Chen reading is in collaboration with GLCA and the English Department. And Tommy Pico's reading um, is co-sponsored by the Robert P. Hubbard Fund, Snowden Multicultural Center, and the Kenyon College's Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. <coughs> In addition to the readings, you will find poems scattered all about campus being hung here and there. Some magical people will hang them on Tuesday night. Uh, and if you see one and you don't already have one in your pocket, Place a poem in your pocket, and then if you go to the bookstore and read a poem to the uh, people when you check out, they will give you a 20% off discount, uh, both Wednesday and Thursday. So, mm -hmm. that's our poem in your pocket celebration. Mm -hmm. All right, let me introduce David Lynn. David Lynn, a proud member of Kenyon College's graduating class of 1976, has been the editor of the Kenyon Review since 1994. Under his leadership, the Kenyon Review has grown from being a fine literary journal with a rich history to a world-renowned literary arts organization currently celebrating its 80th anniversary. In addition, he has been a devoted English professor here at Kenyon College for over 25 years. During this time, he has been a senior Fulbright scholar in India and a visiting scholar at Wolfson College of Oxford University. In addition, he is the husband of Wendy Singer, Kenyon's Wortman Professor of History, and the proud father of Aaron and Mia. In addition, he writes, his collections of short stories include Year of Fire and Fortune Telling. He is also the author of the novel Wrestling with Gabriel and the critical study The Hero's Tale, narrators in the early modern novel. His stories and essays have appeared in magazines and journals in America, England, India, and Australia. And today, we celebrate the launch of his newest short story collection, Children of God, which T.C. Boyle calls a revelatory collection with exquisitely wrought stories that dwell deeply in place and character. And Anne Patchett describes the collection as graceful and astute, beautifully written, and keenly intelligent. In addition, David Lynn is a brilliant and wonderful human being. Please join me in welcoming David Lynn. Hi, y'all. Uh, first, let me begin by thanking Elizabeth for that ridiculous uh, introduction, <laughs> putting this all together uh, for everything she does and for what the Kenyon Review uh, staff and family uh, do. Uh, one of the, it's one of the joys of my life and it's also a joy to have an event like this with so many friends and students and colleagues which are all kind of the same thing <coughs> in the audience. I'm, I'm really uh, pleased you're here. Thank you for coming. Uh, because this is a book launch of sorts uh, rather than a regular reading, I am going to read uh, but briefly uh, and, and short uh, selections from two different stories. But I wanted to begin um, by talking a little bit about uh, the collection and um, about the short story. So, um, as I began to put this collection together a few years ago, I realized it would be out around the time I turned 65. 
which I did recently. Um, and um, 65, like many things, is a kind of arbitrary moment in time. It doesn't really uh, change the way you feel or certainly with me behave. Um, but, um, uh, but it is a milestone. Uh, and, and most milestones are arbitrary. They're just stuck down somewhere. Um, but what they do is not only tell you where you are, but they give you a chance to pause, if you choose, sort of outside of time, uh, and uh, take stock of um, not only where you're going, uh, which for me is uh, an exciting sort of unknown after next year, uh, and, and also where you've been. And so uh, the stories in this collection uh, go back uh, about 40 years. Uh, to not long after I left this place, like so many of you are about to. Um, and um, uh, sort of at some point passed from an apprentice stage uh, as a writer to whatever after that happens. Um, people sometimes ask me, students sometimes ask me, um, are you a better writer now? Are your stories better now um, than they were then. And uh, it's been interesting. Putting this together was a joy because a lot of these stories I hadn't read in 30 or 40 years. There had been simply no occasion. I've been busy and I've moved on with life. And reading them was a surprise and, and uh, to, to quote a phrase, a surprise and a delight. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I, I truly enjoyed it. And the answer to the question is, no, I don't think I'm really a better writer than I was then. I think there was a qualitative dis, dis, uh, difference from when I moved from being an apprentice to being a writer, although, as I was saying to Tyler Guerin uh, last week, uh, I never called myself a writer before I had some publications under my uh, belt. I felt that that's an honorific you use, you earn. Uh, it's sort of like wearing a beret, you know? <laughs> you, have, you have to earn the right. Um, and. Um, <coughs> Uh, I think that I've matured as a writer, I've learned new tricks, I've tried new strategies, I may have become more self-conscious about the process and all of that, but I, I, I think in terms of um, the emotional honesty and power of the stories, so in all honesty that's up for you to decide, um, I don't think uh, the new stories are qualitatively um, different from the old. Uh, and, and for me, uh, that was pretty wonderful. So this, this is a, a new and selected stories, which means uh, about two-thirds of them, roughly, um, appeared in earlier collections, as well as uh, journals and magazines. And about a third are stories that have appeared in, in journals, but never before in, in book form. Uh, and I'm very, I'm very proud of them. I never knew when I was beginning uh, what kind of writer I would be. That is, I suppose I imagined uh, uh, writing novels that would turn into screenplays and make me uh, vastly wealthy, uh, which obviously happened. Um, uh, and I've written novels and I've written a lot of different kinds of things. Uh, but short stories have always felt like my métier, something that um, um, seems natural, some, something that I feel at home in. And um, one of the challenges, one of the biggest challenges of teaching at Kenyon College is, damn it, you don't get to coast. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, students and former students here. Tori Weber was my student two or three years ago, something like that. Uh, Kirsten Reach, maybe a little after that, who's now the Proud, I'm proud that she's now the fiction editor of the Kenyan Review. Um, and the, the students who are here who've been in my workshops the last couple of years. Um, this uh, spring, I've had the tremendous good fortune and uh, pain in the ass reality that uh, Claire Olison and Tyler Garrett have been doing independent studies with me. And they're such pains. You know, they come in and they sit down and they start shooting questions at me, and I can't just do what I want to do, which is go to sleep or, or hide. <laughs> I actually have to think and talk with them about 
stories and literature and life and what comes next and, and all of that. And as you all, all of you who do teach uh, uh, know that one of the great things about teaching at Kenyon College is um, if you don't, if, if I'm not a better writer than I was all those years ago, I am a better teacher. And I'm a better teacher because my students make me. Uh, they make me think and grow. And so when Tyler and Claire pop questions at me, it's, it's exhilarating, it's exhausting. <laughs> um, and not long ago we were talking about what makes a short story a short story? Why do I feel that it's so natural for me? And, and I think I have a, a, a better perspective than, I've, than I used to have, or a deeper or personal understanding of it. Short stories are not just short stories. They're not shorter versions of, of, of novels. Um, they are a, a separate form that I, I believe is um, largely illusion. And the illusion is that it's absolutely natural and the uh, easiest thing in the world. And it all the story all came forth in one swell foop. And, um, uh, but in fact, short stories, unlike novels, are incredibly compressed and concentrated. And as my students get tired of me saying, every word counts, every comma counts. You've got you've to make it matter. And the stakes, though they can be very quiet, the stakes have to really matter. They have to help us enter into something more uh, deeply human. Um, and, 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 and that's why uh, stories matter so much to me. Um, I will also say, I meant to say this earlier, just to embarrass her, uh, my daughter has heard me lecture uh, endlessly around the house. Um, but she's never heard me uh, read fiction so I'm very pleased uh, that she can be with us tonight. So what I'm going to do is read um, from uh, brief pieces from two different stories. The first is from um, Divergence, which is a, a relatively recent story, which uh, won the O. Henry Award or o. o. Henry Prize uh, a couple of years ago, and I, I was surprised and very pleased. Um, and this is the story of a guy named uh, Jeremy Mathis who is a professor of classics at Ransom College. <laughs> Funny that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's a lot like this place we happen to be. And uh, he has an experience, uh, like a dear friend and colleague of many of ours, uh, Jennifer Delahunty, uh, a few years back was riding her bicycle uh, around here and hit a groundhog. And it threw her for a loop. And that just sort of got me thinking. And this story is about Jeremy, who, uh, unlike Jennifer, uh, d d doesn't quite come out of it unscathed. Uh, he, um, uh, he's just uh, received tenure at Ransom. Uh, he, uh, his wife, Shivani, has bought him uh, a beautiful new uh, high-tech road bike and they're taking it out with a group of friends from the college for a ride in the country. Um, and uh, this is sort of what happens uh, then and next. The machine he was riding yielded such a pure joy that without quite realizing it, he'd been out front and pressing his friends beyond their usual pace. Worry about reading this in front of Mark Coleman, speaking of serious uh, cycles. Um, he'd been out front impressing his friends beyond their usual pace. He eased coasting so that Gretchen could swing into the lead. As he drifted back to her side, Shivani was breathing hard, but wouldn't grant him the satisfaction of admitting it. She was also smiling broadly. So, she said. Yeah, he said. Nice. He was feeling strong and swift. He'd remember that afterward. The rhythm of the ride, the entire day, was perfect. There was satisfaction even in the way his sweat was wicking efficiently into the breeze, except for this one annoying patch high on his brow just under the lip of his helmet. He flicked at it with a finger and in that instant spied the groundhog ambling out of tall grasses along the river. This too, he recalled later. 
how it raised its snout, spotting them in turn. <coughs> Maybe Jeremy was caught up in his own momentum, rhythm, surprise. He hesitated. Had he started to call out? The muscles in his throat tightened later when he recalled the instant. For its part, the animal froze as well, considered. Then, with astonishing quickness, hurtled its bulk of rolling muscle and fat across the path. Dodging Gretchen, it rammed heavily into Shivani's spokes. His eyes were already open. This he realized. But only gradually would they tighten toward focus, and only partly. The pounding pulse in his head throbbed more painfully as his vision cleared. But someone was just then sticking a finger in his eye, pushing one lid up and the other, and he was figuring she was a doctor. Who else would poke him with such casual deliberateness? And so this was a hospital, and he was in a hospital. Okay. When he woke again, he remembered the hospital right off. His own lack of surprise, of curiosity, surprised him. The dimmed light in the room seemed to thrum at the same rate as the thud of pain in his head. A woman was hovering between him and the light, looking for something in his face, studying him. Was this the doctor again? He started to ask, and then, the effort too exhausting, fell back and far away. The woman glanced to the side, and then someone else, Shivani, was hovering too, closer. He felt her kiss on his lips. Hey, she said softly, and held a straw to his mouth. Water was good. He sucked after more. What the fuck, he tried to whisper, water dribbling down his chin. Next time, or maybe the time after that, that's when he began to realize something was wrong, or at least different though he couldn't, couldn't put his finger on it, couldn't put a name to it. Shivani had been speaking for a while. He realized this too, but his attention was drifting. He tried hard to appear attentive. Do you remember? She asked. She was asking him. Not sure, he mumbled. He was proud of that answer. It didn't give him away. You saw it just before, right? The groundhog? The groundhog he did remember. Sure, he said. I didn't, that's the thing. I felt Gretchen swerve and the thump as it hit my front wheel, and then I was pitching over. Darling, brave Jeremy, you tried to catch me. So we were both going down. Owen and Lee ran right into us and down into the mangle. What a mess. She sighed and he could tell she was struggling not to cry. He didn't know what to say. He remembered the groundhog. Your helmet split on the pavement just like it's supposed to, but you were knocked cold anyway. The rest of us were nothing but cuts and scrapes. Shivani was struggling with her own helplessness. He closed his eyes. Her voice, its elite Daliwala cadence, more British than the Queen, was scraping, grating, annoying. It had never bothered him before. He knew that. But all this emotion, the concern and guilt, was radiating from her too, demanding a response in kind. Was he supposed to provide sympathy? A quick surge of anger shivered him. His head was throbbing harder. The flame of his little rage, the flame of his little rage expired almost instantly, leaving him frail, a spent wick on the hospital bed. He could not move. Jeremy groaned. Shivani stroked her cool hand across his forehead. She had been at his bedside when he woke. He remembered this too, and he recognized her right off, her eyes tired, the stylish flare of her short hair, unusually must in the non-time of the hospital. He'd known who she was. He'd been glad to see her, truly, to sip the cool water through a straw, grateful not to be alone in this strange place. But now, as he considered, and he was panting lightly through his mouth, he realized that even in that first moment awake, he'd also felt, what? Different, distanced, dislocated, watching this lovely woman from very far away, his wife, hugging a silk shawl against the arid chill, someone he knew so very well, and yet it seemed as though a tether between them had snapped, 
like a tendon torn at bone hinge. A question occurred to him, and he opened his eyes once more. How long? he whispered. She hesitated, searching his face. You've been here two weeks. That stopped him. It took a while to make sense. Two weeks? I was out for two weeks? Shivani nodded, and now she was looking sad and worried and guilty again, and relieved all at once, tears in his eyes, the tears in her eyes. He turned his head. He figured the groundhog must have gotten away free and clear. <clears throat> so, you know, the story is largely about how fragile we are as human beings, not just physically, um, but in terms of what makes us uh, human, in terms of what uh, makes us selves or individuals. And, and, and what a strange thing that is, that, that, that there is this tether, this tie between our physical nature and who we are, and that um, damaging the one in some mysterious way, even if you have all the memories and everything else, you're just not the same person afterwards. And, and that's what Jeremy is dealing with. Okay, the other um, short <coughs> excerpt is from a, an older story, sort of a mid-career story. Uh, that's the um, title story of the book, uh, Children of God. And it's set in uh, uh, India, in Delhi, in the neighborhood called Greater Kailash, which is an upper middle class uh, neighborhood where uh, Wendy and I uh, lived for a year in the 1990s. Um, and it's about a boy uh, named Daniel uh, who comes with his parents to live in Greater Kailash. And, um, and his parents go off to work and sort of leave him uh, with an ayah, which is a kind of babysitter, during the day. And, and before he begins school or any of that, he's just getting settled. And he discovers that there are two different communities of children in GK1. One are the uh, upper middle class kids who live there and, and own the place and feel like they own the place. And then when they go to school, an entirely separate population of children emerges. Uh, and these are the children of the, the workers, the servants, the poor, uh, the people who live in the alleys and shanties and shacks, uh, the alley, the hidden alleys uh, behind uh, Greater Kailash. And um, uh, they have nothing to do with the other community of children. In fact, uh, the, uh, the, the wealthy children uh, are warned by their parents not to be polluted uh, by, by having contact with these other children. Uh, and in fact, the story begins and sort of turns on a soccer ball that belongs to one of the wealthy kids, and then it's a little mis mysterious how one of the other, the poor kids, Ganga, uh, who's in this, this uh, excerpt, gets hold of it, but his family treats it as, as if it's been polluted, and um, ultimately there's some violence uh, on a small scale, but a suggestive scale, between the, the children. Um, in the excerpt I'm going to read, uh, which my dear friend Misha uh, 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 inspired me to read a few weeks ago uh, at the AWP convention, and I thought, oh, this, this is fun, this is, you know, I'll, I'll do this again because this works well for this uh, moment here today. Uh, in this uh, moment, uh, uh, the rich kids have gone off to school. Uh, Daniel is in the house, but he's eager to uh, find Ganga, who he's really interested in, one of these very poor kids who's the son of one of the uh, cleaners, one of the servants, uh, one of the sweepers in, in his house. Um, and so Rina is his ayah, the, uh, the nursemaid, and Radha is the sweeper. Daniel slips away into the back hall once more. Rina, having switched on the small TV to a Hindi movie, will assume he has gone to the toilet or into his bedroom. Radha is, screaming, is scrubbing the stone floor of the bath, and Daniel quietly sneaks past. The heavy door is bolted again 
but not locked. This is the, the back door onto the alley, which the uh, servants use to enter the house each day. But otherwise, you know, Daniel and his family and the other Indians would never use that door into the alley. <coughs> the heavy door is bolted again, but not locked. Carefully, stealthily, he swings the bolt up and pushes it forward. The door creaks open. He draws it shut behind him, and suddenly he is surrounded by high walls and barbed wire and packed dirt ruts, a separate world hidden behind Greater Kailash. Two paces away, the Indian boy is watching him. He hasn't moved. He isn't smiling. Daniel, fighting not to shiver in the cold, hunkers down next to the boy and doesn't smile either. A fire of twigs and dung flickers a few yards away. An old man is warming himself, lean shanks thrust nearly into the kindling. Daniel nods at it. Ganga hesitates, but the other rises and heads to the small blaze. The smoke is heavy, the air hard to breathe, but a dull warmth does hover close. Daniel squats. The old man, chewing toothlessly at something invisible, eyes him, but doesn't move or speak. Soon Daniel has soaked enough warmth or grown used to the chill, and he rises. Without a sound, Ganga sets off, and Daniel follows him deeply into the ma more, deeper into the maze. They turn a corner, two, coming upon other fires scattered here and there. Each bend of walls and dust is all but identical. Disoriented, Daniel coughs, looks back, sees nothing familiar or singular. A heavy cloud of coarse smoke leans on everything. He has no idea where the Indian boy is leading him, what there is to show, but he eager, eagerly follows as if to discover some potent secret he will never find on his own. Ganga has no particular destination in mind. All he yearned for this morning was a glimpse of the white-haired Ferengi boy. He never expected him to enter his world, couldn't even dare hope it. <coughs> Together they wander past a cluster of shacks backed against a concrete wall that bends in an arc for a hundred paces. On the other side is a sewer trench. In this cold weather, the stench is muted, cloaked by the ever-present smoke. Each hut is patched together out of mud and cardboard and scraps of corrugated tin, including the one where Ganga and his mother live. He wonders whether the Ferengi boy will sense anything, will want to see. But Daniel is watching everything carefully without seeing, without sensing, and Ganga suddenly does not want to draw him into the darkness of their hut, to show him they have nothing to offer, not even chai, with his mother off working at this hour. He's imagined sharing his secret treasures of pins and pens, half-smoked cigarettes, and the tiny glass bottles he's collected, one way or another, and hides in a box tucked behind a mat on the wall. But now he realizes this too is impossible. A peacock hen screeches in invisibly, startling Daniel. He trots around the corner and discovers several birds scratching in the dust, pecking at a small roost of garbage dropped next to an anonymous door. A male spreads its wings and lifts heavily to a rooftop overhead. Delighted, Daniel waves to his friend. Ganga follows but doesn't understand what the Ferengi is upset about. Ahead on the path, he spies two of his friends hunched intently. He almost pats the stranger's arm, but hasn't the courage, doesn't know what the response will be. Will he be beaten for risking a touch? Phlegm gathers in his throat at the thought, and he spits heavily at a wall. But Daniel has spotted the other boys too. He tug tugs at Gunga's thin shawl. Gunga grins to be answered so quickly, a thrill shooting through him. But the other boy doesn't notice, and they hurry to find out what in the dust is worthy of such attention. Gunga's friends are squatting on their heels, one wearing a blue sweater vest with a wide gash at the shoulder. The other's brown shawl, identical to Gunga's, is wound tightly ab uh, about his shoulders and knees. Only his dark eyes move. They are quick and alert. Beneath them, a butterfly swatch of pink skin, a birthmark or scar, stretches from cheek to cheek, 
across his nose as if the top white layer has been seared away. Blue Sweater has a stick. He jabs it into the jowl of the pariah dog, which isn't quite dead at their feet. It twitches, muscles pricking involuntarily. Its eyes are crusted shut. Scabs cover much of its lean gray body. Daniel watches, horrified, and slightly sick to his stomach, fascinated. Again, Blue Sweater stabs with indifferent cruelty. No twitch this time, no sigh, nothing. But between one torment and the next, death has worked its transformation. No pretense remains that what lies before them is anything more than, a loosely, get, than loosely gathered sticks covered by a stained rug. For the first time, the boy with the butterfly mask moves, a hand appearing from beneath his shawl to grab one of the dog's hind legs. Without a word or sound, he rises and sets off down the alley, dragging the carcass behind him with some matter-of-fact purpose that is all mystery to Daniel. Blue Sweater follows lackadaisically. Gunga watches his guest uncertain. Daniel is uncertain too. He is sickened and excited all at once. He knows he has witnessed something as ordinary as the dust and smoke about them, and yet it is disturbing, thrilling. He would like to see more, but he doesn't know what, and he doesn't know how to ask. He turns his eyes to the other boy, who wags his head from side to side, reassuringly, imploringly. Still unable to fathom the stranger's reactions or desires, Gunga sets off down another alley. Without warning, they emerge abruptly behind the temple and onto the small Maidan of Greater Kailash. This is the public park where the kids play. The Subjiwala rushes past Daniel, pushing his wooden cart on the cracked pavement toward the next row of houses. His tomatoes, eggplants, and onions glisten purple and red and green in the morning light. Startled, Daniel feels more disoriented than in the maze of alleys. Haven't they wandered leagues and eons from this life? Can reappearing be so easy? Gunga has reclaimed the blue and white soccer ball. Its sheen is fading, but he feels they are on safe ground once more, as if the familiarity of yesterday's game reestablishes the harmony of the universe. The ball scuds toward the blonde boy. Soon, Daniel will return to his house, where Rena will shriek and sob and say never a word to his parents about his disappearance, her terrible failure. This he counts on already. Thank you. take a question or two very briefly before we get to the good stuff the okay. <laughs> So yeah, um, most of your stories, which just thank you for sharing, obviously, but most of your stories seem to be about getting people to stop and listen and pay attention when things are urgent and vulnerable. Um, and it strikes me as somebody that's going to be teaching high school kids for the rest of my life. We're pretty bad at selling kids on the idea that they need or should want books and stories in order to do that. Um, what can people in my position do to best prepare them for that kind of stopping and paying attention and noticing mission that you have? What are they, what are they not getting that they need to be getting between now now when they're in high school and a time that they go to a place like Kenyon? Everybody loves stories. Everybody loves stories. Um, I think younger people love stories that work a little bit differently. When I was young, there was no separate uh, category like young adult. Uh, but I think young adult stories and novels are, are terrific. And I would get uh, students reading, whether it's John Green or, or anyone else, because what, you know, what makes a story a story uh, is that uh, something happens, that something involves emotions that shake someone up and makes that someone think about who they are. 
And uh, whether it's John Green or Robert Louis Stevenson or maybe I hope David Lynn, um, uh, that's what makes stories stories. And I think that if you can get your students reading, um, it's not a hard sell. Just just have them read real stories. Absolutely. Thank you. You made a possibly debatable claim that you don't think you've uh, changed as a writer from then to now. Um, do you think you've changed as a reader of novels and stories? And I don't mean as an editor. I mean reading as a writer. Do you think you read differently? Um, I, I, yes, I think so. I think that we all, you know, reading is a skill. And like lots of skills, like hitting a good surf, it's something that um, develops over time and you get better at it. I think I'm uh, more thoughtful and more self-aware um, of, of what matters to me in stories and novels. Um, and that's why, you know, working with KR Associates and uh, training them and talking with them about these things, that's such a joy for me uh, because it's communicating, um, you know, in, in, in ways that I've come to understand over many years, and I, can, I continue to grow that way. Um, come on in, Lily. <laughs> um, so, does that begin to answer the question? Sure. One more? And if not, that's okay. All right, well, let's get some cake. Thank you all for coming.